Today's episode of Dead Rabbit Radio contains content of a highly disturbing nature. Listener discretion is advised. When a young woman's mother passes away, she feels nothing but grief. But the moment she reaches out and touches the still warm body of her mother, she has no idea the gift she is about to receive. And then we travel to Montana to take a look at the story of an obese man who has one passion in life, eating. But he's not eating Snickers, he's not eating McDonald's, he's not eating chicken parmesan. No, well he probably did eat all that stuff too, but that's not what he's known for. This man loves to eat. He loves to eat little boys. Today on Dead Rabbit Radio. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Dead Rabbit Radio. I'm your host, Jason Carpenter. I'm having a great day. I hope you guys are having a great day too. I hope you guys are having tons of fun doing whatever you're doing. We got a lot of stuff to cover today, so first off, running into Dead Rap Radio Command, returning from yesterday's episode. Everyone get on your feet and give it up for our legacy Patreon supporter, Bryce Dawson. Woohoo, yeah, we have Bryce is coming in. Bryce is coming in with his anti-cannibal clothing. Nobody can take a bite out of him. He's super worried about being attacked by a cannibal, which... Probably not a bad idea, right? Probably is a good idea if you are a fashion designer, design some sort of clothing that when someone tries to bite you, it doesn't let them. <laughs> if it's electric, you're, ah, you're dead. You're, ah. The cannibals are like, oh, it's cooking itself. Yummy, yummy, yummy. You're, ah. Turn it into a roasted turkey. If someone tries to bite you, like the clothes automatically get longer. They, like, try to bite your forearm, and they get a mouthful of cotton instead. And they're like, ah, foiled again. I'm just going to chop your head off. They're like, it's not going to grow. It's not a hoodie. I think most cannibals eat you after you're dead anyway. So I don't just take all your clothes off and cook you, Bryce. Sorry, your anti-cannibal clothing isn't going to work. But good try. You guys can't support the show financially. I totally understand. (laughs) You don't want to be featured on a cannibal episode? What? Why not? If you guys can't support the show financially, I totally understand. I really do. Just help spread the word about Dead Rabbit Radio. That helps out so much. Tell your friends, tell your family, tell everyone you know. Dead Rabbit Radio is your favorite paranormal show. That is how you can help the show grow. And then, once again, I want to remind you guys, BigSkyParanormalCon.com. That is the website you want to go to if... I didn't plan it this way. (laughs) I didn't plan it this way, but if you live in Montana... There is a paranormal conference going on this weekend, September 28th and the 29th, in Butte, 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 Montana. And I will be a speaker there. I'll be one of the uh, present, virtually though. I'll be a virtual speaker. So I'll be like on a projector or something like that. I'll be taking your questions and or giving a presentation. (laughs) I'm honestly not for sure how it's set up yet, but you know, surprise is the spice of life i did not think about i i've been promoting this montana conference this whole week and then today's episode's about a notorious cannibal who once lived in montana horrendous crimes every episode i've done this week i go they're gonna disinvite me they're gonna disinvite me i can't say the name of the city right i keep telling people oh, i'll just be a virtual ed i'll be max headroom floating around a dark room they're like what is this goo Why did we invite this guy? He can't even direct people to our conference. September 28th and 29th at the historic Clark Chateau Museum and Gallery in Butte, Montana. If you live in the area, swing on by. Even if you don't come to see me, I think everyone should support their local paranormal organizations. You guys will have a blast. Even if you're in Florida or whatever, find your local paranormal groups. Guys, go to those conventions. You'll have so much fun. Bryce. Let's go ahead and get this party started. I'm going to toss you the keys of the Jason Jalopy. We're going to leave behind Dead Rabbit Radio Command. Why don't you drive us out to the hospital? (laughs) Nice leisurely drive to the hospital. (laughs) This episode's depressing. It starts off with a dead mom, ends with a cannibal. So let's just get this started. This is a depressing one. We're headed out to this hospital. Bryce is driving us out there. We're about to meet a young woman. We don't have her real name. We'll call her Mallory. 
Mallory is at a hospital because her mother is dying. And you have family there. You have friends there. Everyone's there to give mother and everyone else emotional support. Mom's dying, but they don't know exactly when it will happen. It's one of those things, which, you know, can even almost be rougher. You're just not knowing when, but you know soon. She's in the hospital. She's not coming out. She will die. At a certain point, I've been in situations like this, and I can understand where Mallory's coming from. At a certain point, she needed to go get something to eat. So she's like, okay, Mom, I love you. I'll see you later. And she leaves. I'm going to go get something to eat. I've been there. I've been there. And because you got to get something to eat. you got to get something to eat. So anyways, Mallory leaves the hospital to go get something to eat. And while she's out, she gets a text from her niece saying, hey, Mallory, you need to come back to the hospital. And at that point, when Mallory saw that text, she knew that her mother had passed away. And this is just the way things are. I don't even know if the mother was lucid at this point or if she was, you know, unconscious. But this is just the way things happen. This has happened to me as well. You're not there when they pass. So Mallory goes back to the hospital and she sees her mother in the hospital room and she has, in fact, died. And Mallory's just kind of standing in there. She said she's always been uncomfortable and kind of awkward around death and the topics of dying and all of that. And now we have her looking at the dead body of her own mother. And all of these feelings she already has about dying in general now has been personified in looking at her mother who's recently passed away. Mallory decides like she makes this decision that she wants to touch her mom she wants to reach out and touch her mother and she does she reaches out and she touches her mom and then immediately jumps backwards mallory described it as it felt like an electric surge this massive electrical surge jumped from her mother's body into Mallory. The second she touched her, she felt this jolt that was so powerful, she leapt backwards. Shocking. No pun intended. But that kind of doesn't really explain what Mallory felt. She goes, it wasn't that it was this electrical pulse so much like, a static shock or anything like that. She goes, what it felt like was when I touched her, it felt like it was this electrical surge leaving my mother's body and entering mine, but the surge, the electricity, was made up of an infinite number of thank yous. It was a surge of words. Thank you, 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 her mother's body into Mallory. Mallory's standing there in the hospital room and she doesn't really know what to think about what just happened. She's already awkward around the subject of death and now she has this bizarre experience she doesn't know really how to make sense of. And at that moment, Mallory's mom's best friend walked into the hospital room, walked right up to Mallory and said, Quote, you know, your mom told me that she used to say thank you 1,000 times a day, unquote. And that, and that kind of shocks Mallory as well, because she goes, I didn't tell anyone what I had felt. 
And right after this experience, her friend walks up and makes the statement. And she goes, my mom never told me that. My mom, my mom never even told me thank you. She, I was the one person she left out. She goes, my mom never told me about, she tries to say thank you a thousand times a day. And as Mallory is trying to process all this, her mom's best friend walks in and makes that statement. You know, and it was such a casual statement for the friend to make. It was just something that popped in her head and something she wanted to share with Mallory, not knowing that Mallory had just had this gratitude exchange. Mallory says, you know, it still mystifies her to this day what had happened. She does say that her mother did love gratitude. That was almost like a mantra of hers. Her mother always tried to live a life in a state of gratitude. So it's not unheard of that she would want to say thank you a thousand times a day. It's just Mallory had never heard that particular statement come out of her mother's mouth. And now right after this exchange, right after this infinite number of thank yous, the friend walks in and tells her that. She goes, it does check. My mom always was about gratitude. That was kind of her own spiritual practice. but. She still can't figure it out to this day. It's a fascinating story. I found this posted online. It was posted underneath the name Die on Your Feet. There's really just two things I kind of wanted to address with this story before we move on to the next one, because I definitely want to make sure we have enough time for the next story. First off, you got to think, you know, I don't think the mother planned this as a gift to her daughter. I think if you'd probably ask this mom when she was still alive, hey, do you think it's possible that you appreciate gratitude so much that when you die, when your daughter touches your still warm corpse, she'll feel it. She'll feel all of those thank yous, all of that gratitude. I don't think that this is anything that anyone ever plans for. I don't think that this was some sort of party trick she'd been working on for years. What's interesting is that this is the only story I've ever come across that this happens in. But, you know, when it comes to the paranormal, a lot of times people may experience things. We talk about this a lot of times on the show, and they don't feel comfortable talking about it, or they don't know where to talk about it. Like, in this case, the daughter Mallory, she posted it on the Reddit. Someone asked the question, what is your real-life paranormal story? Think about how many times this happened before Reddit even started. Think, or how many times it could have happened before Reddit started. And now that even Reddit's around, and the internet at large, how many people do you think have had an experience like this? They either don't feel comfortable sharing it, or they don't really even know how to process it. Like, that is truly a paranormal story, getting that surge of gratitude from the body of your dead mom. It's kind of the definition of paranormal, right? It's not normal. It's alongside the normal. So I wonder if this has happened before and other people just don't put... I mean, think about it. If this happened in the 1950s, where, who would you tell? What would you say? If it happened today in Bangladesh and the person it happens to doesn't use Reddit or really use any internet at all, I'm sure they have internet in Bangladesh, but you know what I mean? My point is, is that if they're not telling us the stories, we don't know how common this may actually be. The second thing that's interesting about this story, and it's a little bit of self-insight, what do you think your, what do you think your body is storing up to attack people in a Pikachu-like way? Like if somebody touched you after you died. What do you th what do you think would come out of you? Some kids find your bloated body down by the river, begin poking it with a stick. They're like, ah, gratitude, gratitude, as blowflies are bursting out of your stomach. I wonder, I wonder what my, you know, I was thinking about it today, and I thought, I mean, there it could be a lot of things, right? It could be a lot of things, and people are different phases of their life, but I thought if this holds true and somebody touched my body, I think they would be overwhelmed by curiosity. 
they would be overwhelmed by this idea of i don't know what's out there <laughs> probably give someone schizophrenia honestly they're like oh, ghost aliens mormon bigfoot what's going on the poor coroner who has to deal with my corpse i would say it would be curiosity now what's interesting is i've been curious ever since i was a kid i've always been about trying to learn i've always been about trying to learn things and discover stuff and put these pieces together but at different points in my life, I would say those, that curiosity, like if I had died in my 20s and somebody touched my body, I think it would be full of anger. It would be full of rage. That would jump out of them because that's how I lived. That's how I lived kind of from like 17 to 30 was just very, I was always on edge. It had to be. I didn't live in good neighborhoods and you can't relax. But if you had waited until, say, my 30s, my early to late 30s, I think you would have got a lot of sadness because I wasn't fulfilled in my life. I had actually moved to a much safer area, but um, I was just sad, depressed. People often say I'm the most optimistic person with panic attacks they've ever met. But I just was unfulfilled. I wanted to do a lot of creative things. I just couldn't do them until this podcast. And I think now I've gotten rid of a lot of the sadness. I've gotten rid of a lot of the rage. And now, once again, I think I'm back. I'm where I'm supposed to be, I feel. And I'm back to that just curiosity. And the reason why I say that is that, obviously, like if I died in my 20s, my story would have had a different ending. It would have been the story of an angry man who died angrily. If I died in my 30s, it would have been the story of an unfulfilled artist, a man who daydreamed too much, but never was successfully able to turn those dreams into reality, mostly because of work ethic, mostly because I was lazy. But if I died now, my story would be a man who was so curious about the world and about the crazy things in the world that he dedicated his life. That might be a little grandiose. <laughs> so he, he spent a lot of hours a week exploring these topics and sharing them with others. That would be my story if I died now. And so, what would your surge be? If you happened to die now and somebody touched your body, what, what would be the overriding emotion or feeling leaping from your carcass to this person? And if it is not a feeling, if it is not an emotion that you want to pass on, what can you start to do to change that? It's never too late. It can take a long time. But if you're not happy with the emotion that you would leave in the world, What can you do to start to change that? Not change it overnight, but what would you do to start to change that? Because I do believe that stories like this in the paranormal world happen more often. This is just the one account we have. So we should remember that as we are all going to die at some point, what emotion do we want to leave behind for others to find? When they touch our rotting, bloated corpses that are all found down by the river. Those reptilians, I tempted them, I taunted them for years and years and years, and they finally grabbed me and all of you and eviscerated us down by the river. Bryce Dawson, let's go ahead and toss you the keys to the world, a famous carpenter copter. We are leaving behind this hospital. Fly us all the way out, too. Great Falls, Montana. I have a semi-charmed life. Oh, excuse me, everybody. Burgers coming through. And we're like, huh, what? We find ourselves at a backyard barbecue. It's 1996. We're in Great Falls, Montana, and we see this heavy set guy, this big dude, 
carrying around a tray of burgers, going, excuse me, everybody, I got to make room, move, make room, I got to set these down. He takes this tray of hamburgers and he sets it down on the table, the picnic table in the backyard. He goes, eat up, everybody. Eat up. Enjoy Nathan's famous burgers. And everyone's like, oh, dude, I've heard so much about these. You're like, damn it, Jason. (laughs) I know he said he's a cannibal in the beginning. Are you telling me? This is a true story that took place in 1996 about a guy who was feeding people to other people. Well, hold on. Yeah, you're right, but it gets worse. It gets way, way worse than that. Trust me. We're about to meet this man. His name is Nathaniel Bar Jonah. He's 39 years old, and he's a hefty guy. He's over 300 pounds, living at home with his mom. And it is at his mom's house where he's hosting this barbecue. He's actually had a couple of these barbecues for a while. He's always inviting friends over, neighbors over. Hey, guys, come over. Oh, I was wondering what that smell was, Nathaniel. Yeah, man, come on over. People would come to these barbecues that he would host. And let's say you didn't just want a burger, right? This guy was a master in the kitchen. He also whipped up casseroles, spaghetti, a manja, manja, eat some more. I don't know, Nathaniel, I'm kind of full. No, no, eat some more. Chili, who wants a little bit of Nathan's? (laughs) You're like, Jason, we get it, he's a cannibal, he's feeding people to people. Hold on. He loved eating, he loved eating so much. And he would tell people that. He goes, I just love to eat, I love to eat. In fact, this has been a lifelong thing when he was a baby. He ate so much, he couldn't move. Because he got so fat and his muscles were so underdeveloped that people had to pick him up and carry him around from place to place. And he was so fat, he was heavy to hold. Mom's like, (laughs) her arms are all tired. She's like, anyone else want to hold my baby for a little bit? Big baby ate a lot. Big adult eats a lot. That's in 1996. Let's jump ahead to December 13th, 1999. For the third time in one week, Nathaniel was seen standing outside of an elementary school. And each time they saw him, you know, residents would be alarmed. Obviously, someone who hangs outside of an elementary school, the staff's going to notice. Also, people in the neighborhood were noticing him. And each time they saw him, he was dressed in clothes that would imply that he was in law enforcement. So he'd wear like the slacks and the dark blue shirt. Nothing that would arouse suspicion to a passing police officer right away. It's not like he had a badge and a hat and all that stuff. But if you were a kid and you were walking down the street and a guy started following you dressed like this and he goes, I'm a police officer. I noticed you were jaywalking or I have a description of you stealing candy from a store. You got to come with me. May not fool an adult. It might fool a child. The police do it after the third time. The two things happen. After the third time, the police go, listen, let's pick this guy up. Because we think that there's something. We think that he's trying to impersonate a police officer. And he's hanging outside an elementary school. Let's go pick him up and see what's going on. But there was another issue at play. Back in February of 1996, a 10-year-old boy named Zach Ramsey went missing. Now, witnesses did see Zach walking down an alleyway, followed by an obese man dressed in what appeared to be law enforcement clothing. Witnesses said they noticed a four-door white sedan-type vehicle in the area When Zach went missing, he was on his way to school and he never got there. Witnesses said they saw a a white sedan type vehicle, four door vehicle, actually almost strike Zach as he was walking down the street. The car seemed to almost veer in his way. But the police can never figure out what happened to Zach. But there was one officer, the lead detective in the Zach Ramsey case named Bill Belusky, felt that he had a really good lead. He was given a list of local sex offenders in the area by the FBI, but he said, I actually think 
we need to interview Nathaniel Barr Jonah. And his superiors were like, why? He's not on the list. He goes, yeah, I know he's not on the list, but one, have you seen the guy? He's, he's really overweight. He's obese. He matches the description of the guy following the... Here's the thing, too. Back in 96, there was a lot less obese people. Nowadays, if a suspect is considered obese, you're like, oh, that's 40% of the city. That wasn't the case in 96. He was an obese man, and Nathaniel's mother's car was a white four-door sedan-type vehicle. Bill's superiors were like, "Uh, I don't know if that's enough. And Bill goes, listen, okay, I've been doing a little bit digging on this guy. Did you know that in 1977, when Nathaniel was 20 years old, he kidnapped and tortured two young boys? He told them he was with the FBI, and he had to take them in for questioning, and he drove them out to the woods, and he tortured them. And at this point, Nathaniel was much heavier. He was 375 pounds. He ended up jumping up and down on one of the boys, nearly killing the kid. The kid actually did lose consciousness, and Nathaniel thought he had murdered this boy. And when the boy regained consciousness, Nathaniel and his friend were gone. And he got up and he was able to alert the authorities. The authorities arrested Nathaniel, saved the other boy. Nathaniel did 15 years in prison for that. And his superior officers, Bill Belusky's superior, said, you see if you can get a search warrant, but it could, I mean, we don't know. I mean, that's, who's to say, right? Who's to say? Now, here's the thing. We know, obviously, this guy should be the one who's getting questioned right away back in 1996. Bill knows that, and his fellow police officers know that. But those crimes where he was kidnapping those kids, and in fact, he actually had a history at that point of kidnapping kids, but he wasn't really getting any real time. A little bit of probation here, a little bit of the police just letting him go there because he was underage and he was doing this stuff to kids. But in 1977, when he was 20 years old, in another state, so you didn't have all of these, you know, nowadays they have these federal databases that you can plug into and see what everyone's doing. For this case, Bill basically had to look at this paperwork and make these phone calls and do all this stuff. And he went to a judge to get a search warrant for Nathaniel's mother's house. He goes, I think he had something to do with Zach. And the judge said, that's not enough for a search warrant. The fact that he's obese, the judge has a big old belly, his robe is tight. He goes, no, that's not enough. He goes, well, what about the fact that he already did 15 years for kidnapping and torturing these two other kids. What about the fact that he pretended to be an FBI agent and here we have a witness saying there was a fat man who looked like a cop marching a kid through an alleyway. The judge wouldn't give him the search warrant. So in 1999, when they caught him outside an elementary school three times dressed up like law enforcement, Bill was ready. Bill was like, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna talk to this guy now. So they do. They go and they talk to him. They detain him. When they detain him, they find on him pepper spray, a toy gun, and a badge. So now he's under investigation for impersonating a police officer. Now they get a search warrant for not only his mother's house, which he had moved away in the meantime. He got his own place in the same town, but they got a search warrant for his mother's house where he lived back in 96, and now they got a search warrant for his current residence. When they get the warrant for his house, what they find is a list of 54 names. They're all boys. Some of the names were names of kids that Nathaniel grew up with. Three of the names, police knew that these were previous kidnap victims. They knew it. He had already been questioned and arrested and all of that for the previous crimes. One of the names was Zachary Ramsey. And next to it, the word died was written. They also found some undeveloped film of Nathaniel Barjona 
and three unknown boys, and it was child porn. It was homemade child pornography. They don't know who those three kids were. They were never able to identify them. And this starts this whole process where generally when they come across information like this, they start reaching out to other law enforcement agencies and they're going, does anyone else have any missing kids where Nathaniel Barjona had been at? Does anyone else, any city, any state, because he traveled a lot during his life, and they start trying to link him to these other missing children, and he never admitted to any of the names on that list. He never would verify any of it a little girl whose bike was found by the side of the road and she was never seen again. A little boy walking to school, vanished. They don't know how many victims he had, but they've tried to look into multiple missing person cases and see what they could find. In the end, he was found guilty of kidnapping and molesting three boys. And those weren't the original two that he had tied up in the forest. It was this ongoing investigation. Kids were coming forward. He was found guilty of kidnapping and molesting three boys and sentenced to 130 years in prison. He ended up dying in prison. He had a heart attack due to clogged arteries. Now that's kind of a speed run of the story of Nathaniel Bar Jonah. There's a lot more to it. As far as other investigations he may have been a part of, there are questions of when he started. There are questions of how many victims he had. There are even questions about who were the kids in the film, who were the other names on the list. There's all sorts of questions, and we get these a lot with serial killer stories. But you go, Jason, uh, you keep using the term serial killer. Like, he's never been convicted or even really formally accused of any murders other than the murder of Zachary Ramsey, right? Well, he was never found guilty of that. Because at the last minute, when he was on trial for the murder of Zachary Ramsey and the kidnapping and molesting of three other boys, the defense, Nathaniel Barjona's defense team was able to convince Zach's mother, Rachel Howard, to testify that her son was not dead. They asked her, do you believe that your son is dead? And Zachary's mother said, no, I don't think my son is dead. The defense team used the mother's words, the mother's testimony, to help Nathaniel Barjona not be found guilty of murdering Zach. The mother is like, I don't think he's dead. I don't think he's dead. And I get that. I get that to a point when you look at a lot of true crime stories about Nathaniel Barjona, a lot of people are mad at the mom. A lot of people are mad at the mom. They're like, why did you betray your son like that? And on the same token, Nathaniel ended up getting 130 years due to the other crimes. It's not like he walked free because she couldn't admit to herself that her son was dead because here's the thing for her to admit for Rachel Howard to admit that her son was murdered by Nathaniel Bar Jonah would mean that she is admitting one of the most disturbing stories in true crime history is actually True. Let's go back to before Nathaniel is in prison. Let's go back to when they get those search warrants for his mother's house and for Nathaniel's house. Law enforcement finds these notebooks written in code. And when they begin to decipher the code, what they start to see are recipes. Little Boy Pot Pie. 
French fried kid. Barbecue, be some young guy. These cops are like, what the hell did we come across? Like, we get that he's fat. We get that this kid's missing, and we understand that he might be linked to these other crimes. Are you... What the hell is this? Recipe books for cooking children. When he was in prison, when Nathaniel Barjona was in prison doing that stint for the kidnapping and torture of those two kids back in 77, he told prison psychiatrists that he had fantasies about killing children and then eating them. He's telling them this, and they still let him out of prison. He got sentenced to 18 to 20 years. They let him out in 15. And they actually let him out early after saying things like this. Fellow prisoners were disgusted by him because he had this habit. He had it when he was a kid, but he continued it as an adult. I mean, listen, prison is disgusting anyways. There's like one toilet for every five people if you're lucky. It's sweaty, it's smelly, deodorant is a luxury. Nathaniel would sit there in prison, he would pick at his scabs and then suck on them. He'd suck on his own scabs to the point that one prisoner described it as it looked like he was having sex with them. The amount of ecstasy, the enjoyment he took in sucking off the blood of his fresh scab. (laughs) Listen, man, I know you do your time in prison, you're supposed to get out. This is not the guy that you let out early, especially, let alone try to keep him in as long as possible. People noticed in his neighborhood, they thought it was kind of weird, because he was, again, in 1996, when he was having these barbecues, obesity was nowhere near as prevalent as it was today. So the fact that he was 300 pounds was quite notable in his neighborhood. They also noticed that he would go periods of time without bringing home any groceries. And they go, well, that's interesting. Like he normally is coming home with a bunch of groceries and then like a month would go by, he wouldn't bring home any groceries. Nothing super Notable at the time, but now in retrospect, people are like, was he eating kids? Because he did travel a lot. And if he went five towns away or two states away and kidnapped a kid, because they have missing kids in all these areas that he's been to, and brings them back to his house and he's eating a kid for a couple weeks. But the thing is, that is, is disgusting as that is, it somehow gets worse. Because in these coded textbooks that Nathaniel had written up, he talks about not only eating children via his recipes, but also tricking his neighbors into eating children. He talks about holding these backyard barbecues with the meat of dead kids. During this time period, he had two jobs. Nathaniel had two jobs. He worked at a local Hardee's, which is a fast food chain if you're outside of the United States. I think they're called Carl's Jr. in the West Coast, but Hardee's. And he worked at the kitchen at the local Air Force Base. Police think that he may have been disposing of human meat at those two places as well. In the end, though, they don't really know how many children he killed. They know that he killed Zachary. They 100% believe that he's guilty of that, despite what the mother said. Law enforcement knows that he killed Zachary Ramsey. But they did have suspicions about other murders because... They did have suspicions about other kids because he traveled through all these areas. At a certain point, after he'd been arrested, the police go, you know what, let's go back to that house he was staying in and pull the pipes. Because you can only get rid of so much meat. There's a lot of fat that comes along with being a human and you would pour it in the pipes. I mean, you could take it out in trash bags and things like that, but the chances of a raccoon knocking it over and all of a sudden human fat is spilling across your yard. You pour it down the pipes. 
the police went to the house that he had previously lived in and they asked the owner of the house, hey, can we go look at your pipes? Can we start taking them apart? And the owner said, uh, that's kind of disgusting to think about that this happened in my house, but I'd love to help you guys. The problem is, is I had all the pipes replaced because they were all jammed up. They were constantly clogging up. So I just had them removed. So again, the police think that he could have been murdering multiple children and serving some of the meat at the local fast food restaurant, some of it at the local Air Force base, some of it to his neighbors, and of course, some for the gluttonous psychopath himself. But the darkest part of this story, and again, probably one of the darkest parts of true crime history, around the time that Zachary Ramsey had gone missing, Nathaniel Barjona is holding one of his big backyard barbecues. And people had said at previous barbecues, this meat tastes really interesting. I, I don't actually know what this is. And he would tell them it was venison. This was venison that he had caught, him, that he had hunted himself. It's like fresh. It's as fresh as it could be unless the deer jumped over the fence right now and I blew its brains out. <laughs> people eating chili, people taking seconds of spaghetti. Juicy hamburger in somebody's mouth. At that backyard barbecue, after Zachary Ramsey had gone missing, at that particular barbecue, there is a woman there, and she takes a bite, and she tells Nathaniel, Ugh, this meat is repulsive. This is disgusting. And Nathaniel goes, Listen, that meat is fresh. In fact, he, quote, hunted killed, butchered, and wrapped the meat himself. That woman holding that burger with a bite out of it was Rachel Howard, Zachary Ramsey's mother. Nathaniel watched her take a bite out of her own son's meat. (laughs) 